I never speak in public with my jacket on. I never speak in public with my shoes on. I never speak in public. <laughs> now, I have a script here. When I was young, I used to write everything down to make sure that I never forgot what I was going to say. Now I write everything down to make sure I only say it once. <laughs> Thank you, Tibor, for your wonderful words. They were so persuasively spoken, I could almost believe them myself. And thank you, Shireen, for making this whole event possible. I have 10 minutes in which to speak, and if any of you laugh, we go over time. <laughs> now, my subject tonight, I was looking for something fresh, something different. I've been talking about intellectual property for the last 40 years. I've been wheeled out for reception after reception, conference after conference. What am I talking about? Give me a little list. You want me closer? How's that? Yeah. Right, fine. OK. So what are we talking about? Patents and innovation. Innovation and patents. Innovation and branding. Branding and trademarks. Trademarks and branding. Branding and trademarks, the need for innovation. You, you get the picture. So tonight I thought I'd give you something completely different, something innovative, something exciting. So to coin the phrase, actually it's not quite true. When people say to coin the phrase, what they actually do is steal a phrase because they always give somebody else's phrase. I'm going to coin the phrase. The topic I'm going to talk to you about tonight, very briefly, is porn queens and obscenity. It says here, pause here for maximum effect while shocked audience recovers its posture. <laughs> No one in this room has ever heard me talk about porn before. So let's start with the subject of porn. In the game of chess, each side starts with a number of pieces of substantial individual value. A king, a queen, two castles, two bishops, two knights. And each player also possesses a little row of very pretty little pawns, eight of them, which sit there in front of the major pieces. The pawns are, for the most part, generally regarded as being perfectly expendable. They're easily lost. It doesn't hurt anybody very much when they are. They're often taken for granted, pushed around, for want of anything better to do with them, sacrificed for short-term gain, or simply ignored. Big pieces hide behind them when they're attacked use them as shields. On the whole, the life of a pawn is not a very happy one. <laughs> but, as the game progresses, and the bigger pieces get progressively eliminated from the board, the value of each surviving pawn increases. If you are a devotee of that distinguished 19th century English novelist, Lewis Carroll, and you've read Alice Through the Looking Glass, you will know, without further prompting, that occasionally a pawn gets through to the end of the board and is promoted and becomes a piece of its own choice, generally the queen, a piece of great power, a piece with the power to determine the course of the rest of the game, a piece with the power to win it. Now, what's this got to do with Shireen? What's it got to do with intellectual property? You've probably worked that one out already. Uh, those of you who have ever worked for or advised or been involved in any way with uh, a small or medium-sized enterprise, an SME, particularly if you've been involved with a micro-business in its earliest stages, you will know the meaning of my little homily about pawns. Britain's small businesses are very, very much like pawns in the game of chess. Individually, each little business, so far as the economy is concerned, is worthless. It's almost invisible. It's hardly worth uh, anything at all on the grand scale of things. Yet, as time progresses, a small business, given the chance to establish itself, given the chance to progress, can really achieve something if it's not eliminated by the game or competition, as we call it in this country. If it doesn't suffer from undercapitalization, 
lack of strategic possibilities for growth, inability to compete with cheap foreign goods or labour, if it can survive liberal doses of poor advice, and if it can withstand the momentum of technological change, those businesses that hang on in there, those little businesses that don't die, the small number, the hundredth of a hundredth of a thousand that actually carry on, reach the end game. They are the enterprises that become the big businesses, the stars, the bankable propositions, the ones you want to have your pension fund in, on which the security of our economy in this country is founded. Almost every big successful business in this country today started off as a small company some time ago. Harrods. Anyone been to Harrods recently? You wouldn't have wanted to go there when it started. It was a haberdashery in Southwark. Marks and Spencers, your m and was originally a stall at a penny bazaar in Leeds. Burberry was originally a man who was making outdoor clothes in Basingstoke. Tesco was a stall in Hackney. Clark Shoes were originally slipper makers in the village of Street in Somerset. And all the major British distillers and brewers, pretty well, they all started off as little companies. They grew, they were formed, and they became promoted to Queens. Even the illustrious British Library, in which we're celebrating this lovely event today, started off as just one train timetable, a couple of Bibles, and a bookshelf in Bermondsey. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> anyway. Right, my talk tonight, I don't know how much of you are paying attention. Are you paying attention? You're, you're doing, right. But for those of you whose memory has been ravaged by the depredations of time, anxiety, and alcohol, so not necessarily in that order, um, my subject is porn queens and obscenity. We've dealt with the porn queens, the porn of the queen, and now we get to deal with the obscenity. And that, I'm sad to say, has been provided by our very own government and its immediate predecessor in creating so great a gulf between their very encouraging words of lip service, of support to small businesses, new businesses, innovative businesses, and the institutional arrangements which they set up for supporting them. The vast gulf, and it's wrong, it's wicked. Over the past couple of years, and indeed before that, our own excellent, user-friendly, intellectual property office. Anybody had any dealings with the IPO? Nice people, good people, answer the phone, get back to you, give you good advice but they haven't got any money. They're good. But they're answerable to junior ministers who have no experience of intellectual property and whose responsibilities are so wide and so varied that while they're holding office, they never have a chance to master the IP brief. They don't understand what we're all about. Protecting innovation, protecting new brands, developing them, exploiting them. They don't have a chance to pick up the rhythm of what we're doing. They don't dance to the beat of intellectual property. Which means that we have no one to support us in government. We have no one to support us in parliament. All we get is promises that we will have more evidence-based research and more committees and more inquiries and more proposals. And what we want is more action. The same applies when we're trying to enforce intellectual property rights. We've got an innovation, we want to protect it. We've got a new brand, we don't want people to use it. And we find that the police, the trading standards, the customs, the civil courts, all have different responsibilities, different tunes. It's like different bands, and there's nobody to give them the same tune to play and to conduct them. We don't have an overseer in the United States. They have an intellectual property enforcement coordinator who sits in the White House and she has the ear of the president. We have nothing like that to conduct our intellectual property over here. But what do we do have? We have the opportunity to have a good moan. We have the opportunity to blame the European Union, even though it's not its fault. But until the Great Revolution comes, we also have 
the opportunity to rely upon people like Shireen, who have taken the trouble to serve the IP community, to enrich it, to share her ideas, to publish her ideas, to give guidance, to give advice, to talk sense, to show that she has not only business sense and legal sense, but that she shares human values which permeate our aspirations and our businesses. Shireen, over the years that I've known you, it's been, and this isn't in the script, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to work with you, to exchange emails and ideas with you, to discuss things with you, and to see that here is a person who does dance to the beat of IP, a person who is sensitive to the needs of businesses, the needs of people who invest their lives and their hopes and their aspirations in trying to make a humble crust and get it up and running. And I really respect the fact that you've done that. And my, my blessing to you is that the book should be bought and read and appreciated, even by people who never take the trouble to pick up the phone and thank you for it. Thank you very much. Thank you.